This is Society Bites Radio. I'm Steve Ryan for Coastal Progressive and Rainbow Forum, bringing you topics of interest for the progressive and LGBTQ plus community. Today, we're welcoming as our guest, David Woodhouse. Uh, David is a, his topic of his uh, interview with us today will be the Florida, the perfect storm. David is a professional hydrologist with over 50 years of experience in the environmental field where he has consulted in the private and public sectors that needed, they included the EPA, COE, Department of Justice, and all the military branches on the characterizations and cleanup hazards of waste. Also a court-recognized expert on the bedrock fracture flow, he will outline today where the underlying fracture limestone terrain exacerbates and allows contaminants to migrate into rivers, wells, and ultimately to golf where nutrients enrich that bad word we have here, red tide. David, welcome. Uh, please give me a little bit of, of insight in what you're going to be talking about today. Well, I like to discuss what I call a perfect storm. If I may uh, digress for one moment, and we'll get into geology 101, but Florida, your audience would like to know, used to be part of Africa. We, we were connected at one time to uh, Guinea in Senegal, and millions of years ago, we were part of the North American plate. I think you know much about uh, plate tectonics. It broke off and left Florida behind, and there was a big hole in the ground which got filled with sediments and ultimately turned into limestone. And as luck would have it, there were these plates hanging around called the Caribbean plate, the North American plate with Florida, and what they call a Caicos plate. And they were all bumping and grinding into each other. Because of that, Florida got fractured. There were what they call horizontal fractures, which formed, that was from what they call stress relief, if I may use that term. We had tension fractures, which formed vertical fractures, and we had plates that were trying to go over each other or under each other, which formed these angular fractures. So if we went below the ground now into the limestone, we will find literally millions and millions of fractures, all connected like a highway system. And these are the, if I may use the word, the conduits for water to flow, as well as hazardous waste to flow. And we'll get into it later on. But that was the basic... Uh, for my calling it the perfect storm, Florida sort of got left out there by the wayside when it came to, let's say, being the lucky part of the world. So we're flat. We have a bridge that runs down the middle. The water drains to the east and west from that, which we'll get into. So that's a brief history of time. <laughs> and that's ironically, interesting. If I very interesting. Just let me interject one second. I moved down here from Boston, which is also a part of Africa. So now you may go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I was going to ask you here, uh, you you mentioned uh, here about the uh, fractured terrain. What what is What exactly does that mean, the fractured terrain? It just it means, means that... Go ahead. Yeah. It just means that the terrain of Florida is it's underlain by fractured limestone. So everywhere we go in Florida, we will be underlain by fractured limestone, no matter where you go. And in that limestone, we have different aquifers. Uh, the major one is the Floridan aquifer. And right now we withdraw probably a trillion gallons of water a day Wow. Uh, the, uh, uh, the underground. Amazing amount of water. And the capacity, though, of the Florida aquifer is in the quadrillions. So it's a highly pervious uh, fractured terrain where it can uh, hold water. Unfortunately, it also holds things that aren't good. <laughs> and we're going to get into that. And some of that limestone actually dissolves from the uh, uh, acid rains, for example, it forms what they call KARST, K-A-R-S-T, topography. Now, you can drive a truck 
through some of these openings in the limestone. So you can just imagine if anything uh, that's hazardous gets into that, how fast it goes and where it goes. So, go ahead. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, what are some of the sources of the, uh, the contamination? I know I think I've heard of fertilizers, septic tanks, stormwater, and runoff, and uh, injection wells, industrial waste, so forth. Can you explain where some of this comes from? Because I guess it comes from people who have these old septic tanks still in Florida. Yes, I'm, I'm making well, a guess here. But right now, yeah. I'd say Florida is reaching maybe a point of no return. Right now, there's 2.7 million ga uh, septic tanks in Florida. Now, as you know, each one of them uh, is built to handle sewage. And uh, in that sewage, we have a high load of nitrogen, which is not good. We have stormwater, which ultimately flows into the underlying rock. We have stormwater runoff. We have injection wells from industry. Now, some of these wells are over 1,000 feet deep. And they dump whatever type of waste they have. It goes down into those injection wells into the rock. We have industrial waste and what I call uh, out of sight, out of mind, or out the back door. Uh, throughout my career, I witnessed uh, the illegal disposal of waste into the environment. And it goes down into the, uh, the ground as contamination and has to go somewhere. Uh, one of the big issues we have right now, if I may say it, is mosaic, which has been expanding its minds. That's probably yeah, a separate issue unto itself. Lord, yes, now, I've seen just, some of these sinkholes they had over there. Unbelievable. Well, just let me mention, too, uh, in the paper there were some recent sewage spills uh, in Sarasota, and... Some of the sewage went into Sarasota Bay, some went into the swells, and I'm just quoting right here. This is what was in the paper. The sewage, which was absorbed into the ground, did not enter any body of water, body of water, according to the county. Well, we know that's wrong. It did go into the aquifer is where it went, and uh, now oh, it's... Boy. it's, it's it's moving, and if you want to take a second, I, uh, we can talk about what we call environmental sinks, so we can talk about it later on. No, go ahead now. That, that, sounds, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Now, all water ultimately flows east to the Atlantic or west into the Gulf of Mexico. Those are what we call the ultimate sinks. If you look on a national scale, all water flows east from the Rockies or west to, the Cal from, to California, and that's, that's a great divide. So, you know, uh, just think of the big picture now. You have the ultimate sink, but you have local sinks. So water locally will, will flow into rivers, streams, and to some degree into lakes. The water just not sit there. If it did, we'd be underwater. So it discharges. It's a law of physics. It takes a path of least resistance and flows into these, uh, again, environmental sinks. Those, in turn, flow into the Atlantic and into the Gulf of Mexico. And we can get into, uh, we can get in the red tide in a moment, but all that contamination is what they call it upwells. So you have fresh water flowing underground slowly. It reaches the ocean, and now we have salt water. The fresh water now has to flow on top of the salt water because the salt water is denser. So it flows up onto the uh, salt water, and it's called upwelling. And all that waste ends up in the ocean, and it causes a lot of issues, and we'll be discussing that in a few moments. But as I said, nothing can stay under the ground forever. It discharges. Right. So that's that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, what about the situation at Lake Okeechobee? I understand that they have, they've had some horrible contamination down there. Yeah, Okeechobee... Uh, 
is discharge. They had a huge blue-green algal boom. But as you know, uh, we've been dealing with... Yeah, that was covered on the news, right? Yeah. Now, lakes also, uh, what they call this... um, uh, Well, maybe there's a better word for it. But anyway, they discharge into the lake. It's an environmental sink, per se, but it still will accept water or contamination. And so you get all this fertilizer coming in from big sugar into the lake, and they had this tremendous algal bloom. Now, this lake also discharges through canals. Some of it flows east, but some of it feeds into the Okeechobee River. And that, uh, not Okeechobee, I'm not, I beg your pardon, Calusahatchee River, I'm sorry, I apologize, <laughs> into the Calusahatchee River. And again, this stuff, again, is moving through the rock. It's got to go somewhere, so it goes into the environmental sink, the Calusahatchee, and ultimately, believe it or not, it works its way across Florida over time into the, uh, the ocean. So Okeechobee has always been a source of contamination. This by its very nature that the big sugar chooses to, you know, develop it and they use fertilizers by probably, I would say, thousands of tons of it. And that fertilizer's got to go somewhere. And that's a lot of nitrogen in it. Phosphorus, I want to point that out too. That's a lot of that comes from mosaic. And we'll get into that when we talk about uh, the red tide. Hey. the so we're saying that the water all goes either east or west here in Florida, and then yes. some of it sinks sinks down into Okeechobee via the rivers as well. Right, um, it flows it flows into Okeechobee as because that's an environmental sink too. Okay, the um, uh, and the and the definition of let's go this one more time maybe I think we may cover it already but what is the definition of an environmental sink? It's a body of water, whether it's a stream or the ocean, which accepts water discharging from the environment. So in that case, I guess the Gulf of Mexico would be the ultimate environmental sink. That, <laughs> every, ocean, every ocean is what they call the ultimate sink on this okay. planet. Everything ends up in the ocean eventually. Again, it might take hundreds of years. I'm not saying that in case in Florida, but even out in the deserts, water flows below and finally discharges somewhere. It moves. Very interesting. Right. Now it moves obviously so, because we're on we're on a planet that's moving. <laughs> Just that's like right, the tides. The, 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 right. Yeah. And that's the tectonic plate movements. I'm I'm guessing you're referring right. to there. And, and the tides it's all moving. Tides suck move water, and same thing. With the Earth is spinning, and it's a fluid, so it moves and doesn't stay where it is. Uh, so uh, you you mentioned okay, what is the upwelling effects of, on red tide? You mentioned that I think we were right. we wanted to talk about that yes. a little bit. Uh, all right. Now this is very interesting, and it's been proven the contaminants. Well, in this case, let's just say nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen from fertilizer and septic tanks, phosphorus from, say, mosaic, but there are other sources too. Red tide needs nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, these fractures that I spoke about, they continue under the ocean. So the water flows, I'll use the word water, fluid, maybe it's a better word flows through the fractures and discharges in the ocean through these fractures. Some of these fractures are along the shore, 